I've got it on my iPad here. I'm trying to pull it up on my other screen, but. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's call this meeting to order. And I believe the first item on the agenda is going to be the Pledge of Allegiance. Or do we, no, roll call. Did you want to do the introduction of the newly appointed or newly elected counselors and school board members? Sure, yes. So um, thank you. We have uh, two new counselors joining us tonight, and we'll be doing a swearing in shortly. Um, Nicole Boucher and or Boucher, excuse me, I know too many Bouchers, um, and Gretchen Noonan, as well as two new school board members, Cindy Voltz and Jen McVeigh. Um, and we will um, go ahead with the roll call uh, first, Deb. Uh, Councilor Boucher? Present. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. And Councilor Noonan? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, so the next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone could please. Yeah. I pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it, for which stands, it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. All right, our first order of business is the election of the town council chairman. Um, and uh, so I believe we have a draft motion um, if somebody would like to make that. Actually, I'll first make I a motion. Should, right. oh. First, I should. Uh, oh, go do, ahead. Do, do we uh, do we have to see if there's any public comment before we make a motion? I think you're okay on this one, uh, okay. Councilor Gabrielson. Thanks, Penny. Is there a second? Okay. Or, do you want me to read the motion? Do you want me to read the motion? Yes, please. Uh, oh. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, just so we know who we're electing as our chair. Um, okay, I'd like to move that um, we elect uh, James N. M. Jamie Garvin to serve as chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council for 2021. Seconded. Great, and um, we'll do a roll call vote. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Newland? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank Great. you. Thank you for um, starting off the meeting, Jeremy. Um, and thank you all for um, your, your confidence that you're placing in me. I appreciate that. Um, we have about 16 folks um, joining us virtually uh, as meeting participants. Just wanted to put that on the record. Um, and then uh, congratulate also, again, uh, Councilors Boucher and Noonan as well as school board members McVeigh and Volts. I know you all took your oaths individually uh, in person earlier today. <clears throat> so you're duly sworn, um, but uh, did wanna take just a second to, to recognize all four of you. Um, and most importantly, thank you for your willingness to serve on both, both bodies. It's greatly appreciated and the service that you're performing for the town is invaluable. So thank you very much. <clears throat> um, with that, we'll move to item number five on the agenda, which is town council reports and correspondence. Does anybody have anything they wish to report at this point? Councilor Devereaux? Um, first of all, I too would like to congratulate um, our two new councilors to the town council. Welcome, Nicole Boucher and Gretchen Noonan. Thank you for um, serving 
and welcome to our two new school board members, Cindy Voltz and Jen McVeigh. Congratulations. And, you know, this has been a um, really interesting year for everyone, and it's taken a lot of time and energy with lots of meetings, especially school board and town council. So I really want to commend you for deciding to run during a time like this, and it's really appreciated. I want you to know that. Um, second of all, I want to um, congratulate the uh, Beach to Beacon, TD Beach to Beacon um, 10K. They, let me get this right. They received the Bib Rave Green Lion Award for sustainability uh, for running events that have integrated sustainable environmental practices into their race operations. They were also voted number one race in America of road races 10 miles or less, which is huge. So I just wanna congratulate you, thank you. And um, we look forward to hopefully a race this year. So that's uh, my news for today. Anybody else have anything? Penny? Um, yes, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge some really uh, uh, brave people to be starting businesses in uh, any town at this point in time. And so I want to welcome uh, new businesses to our town center as, um, and just stress to people that we constantly hear feedback that Cape Elizabeth needs more uh, small businesses. So I, uh, I hope that people will um, uh, make sure to patronize these businesses because we aren't going to get additional small businesses in town unless we can help uh, each and every business um, survive. So I just want to welcome the Lumbery Dotco and the uh, Tacos and Tequila to town. Thanks, Penny. Anybody else have anything at this point? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the Finance Committee report. Over to Councillor Gabrielson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I brief, a very brief finance committee report. Um, Matt uh, sent out the uh, financial dashboard um, earlier today. I uh, just want to note that uh, revenues and expenses both seem to be trending in the right direction. Um, expenses are trending pretty much as we forecast and uh, revenues are doing, doing pretty well. Obviously we have, um, it looks like some slight uh, reductions in revenues on pay and display over the previous year. Um, hopefully some ability to make that up in the spring, but um, other revenue sources seem to be tracking pretty well. So. Matt, anything you want to add or any questions for Jeremy? Go ahead, Matt. Sure. Uh, I'd, be, I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, as uh, you'll notice, excise tax is uh, doing very strong uh, this year as well. Uh, as well as our, our pay and display. And I think uh, there is you know, there is an item later in the agenda to discuss expansion of the, uh, of the season uh, for that. So I think that combined, uh, we should overshoot. Uh, I think we were going to meet or exceed uh, what our anticipated revenues was uh, as currently constructed. But with that, I think we will exceed and that'll be a nice, uh, if that does take place, that'll be a nice addition to the town's coffers uh, that'll help us offset uh, other areas relating to uh, bus traffic and uh, and some of the other uh, tour uh, tour buses and trolley uh, revenue that we would have anticipated otherwise. And then uh, you'll notice from this point forward, as we come into December, uh, our salt line will change month to month as we start buying salt and sand. So uh, we are we are in a good position. And uh, every day, as uh, Public Works Director Jay Reynolds said today, every day that it doesn't snow is a day that we're we're healthy on the other side of the balance sheet. So but you will see that change uh, in the upcoming uh, next few months as we, as we maintain our stores. Any questions for Matt or Jeremy? Um, the only thing I wanted to just add um, a couple of things that have more macro level, um, uh, I'm sure folks may have seen uh, article in the uh, 
local paper uh, in the last day or two about um, uh, school uh, budgets and, and um, uh, impact of enrollment shifts and things like that that I think are going to be um, challenging us as we come into budget season uh, in just a few short, relative short weeks here, um, as well as the continued impasse um, at the federal level uh, of any funding for states and local municipalities um, as it relates to, um, you know, COVID emergency funds and things like that. So I, I, I you know, month after month, we've been looking at a, a pretty rosy picture here on the financial dashboard, um, which is great. Um, you know, certainly there are many communities that would be envious of our position here. Um, but I think there is still going to be some hard work ahead in the budget planning season coming up. And I know Matt and staff are attuned to that. And, um, you know, the great unknowns of, of, you know, what dollars are going to be flowing downhill out of Augusta. So um, anyway, I just, I just want to sort of, I'm not trying to be a wet blanket, but also trying to, you know, sound a little bit of a, a cautionary note of realism there um, as we look ahead to the next fiscal year. So, um, you know, one of the things I think we saw in the last budget year was um, the impact of all this probably was going to have a lagging, uh, you know, a lagging residual effect um, versus the immediate impact that we necessarily saw aside from some short-term expenses um, that needed to be put into place. So um, on the revenue side, I think the, the impact is going to be longer lasting and, and deeper. Um, and we're going to all have to um, roll up our sleeves to, to probably do some hard work um, in the budget season this year. So anyway, I just wanted to add that context um, for everybody as well. Uh, any other comments or questions before we move off of the Finance Committee report? Seeing none. Um, are there any citizens joining us tonight that wish to speak about something that is not listed on tonight's agenda? Um, now is your time to do so. Uh, please use the raise hand function in your um, Zoom meeting and you'll be recognized and uh, mic opened. Is there anybody that wishes to talk about something not on tonight's agenda? I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to pass it off to Matt for his manager's monthly report. Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll start off by saying our battle against COVID-19 continues. As recent reports have shown increases in the positive cases, while last week Cumberland County was officially placed on the watch list by Maine CDC. With that information in mind and some limited exposures within our operations, our plan is to maintain our current hours and protocols. Our operations have a flow chart of managing exposure that I shared and uh, worked with department heads as of today. Uh, as this information comes out, we try to keep up to date with the most current uh, tactics and, and approaches. This has a way of managing exposure, testing decision points, and direction on when to quarantine and when it is safe to return. This is with the express desire to keep our operations open and staff and our customers safe. Our plan is to continue business with town hall services by appointment, curbside operations at the Thomas Memorial Library, as well as other town operations altered in response to the pandemic. The governor's most recent executive order regarding masks will result in new signage at Fort Williams Park with the desire to remind on the executive order for mask wearing. This is not to say people are not trying hard and doing their part. It's just as a reminder to visitors for this requirement. As uh, Chairman Garvin just noted, departments are working on the annual budget uh, with capital planning and crafting of operational budgets underway. The annual audit is in its final stages, and we should be receiving the final product shortly with a joint workshop with the school board to review the document in a January workshop. The Kettle Cove Watercraft Launch Improvement Study was completed by Sebago Technics. And our next step in this process is to hold a neighborhood meeting and share the initial recommendations with the neighborhood and other interested parties. That is going to be scheduled for January 14th, 7 p.m. Following this meeting, the study and its recommendations will be submitted to the council and this will be for your review after that meeting on uh, with the meeting for February 21st at that council workshop. The goal is to apply for land and water conservation fund granting in the spring. And the state is firmly in support of this proposal and we anticipate we'll, we'll be receiving easement language from them in late January. 
as well as that uh, they've expressed a uh, that they will also provide a, a letter in support of our application for grant funding in the spring as well for the land and water conservation fund. So that's that's very encouraging as that moves forward. The Village Green project was inspected Thanksgiving week by myself, the town planner, engineer, and public works director. There are a few details that need completion, and we anticipate that the acceptance of the property will be on the January council agenda. Finally, I'd, I'd like to receive guidance from the council on holiday closures. Uh, both Christmas and New Year's Day are on Friday this year. Now, a number of towns and the city of Portland are closing on both Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. And this is partly as a gift of time to employees for service in the challenging year, but also as a way to limit exposure during this viral surge. Uh, I'd like to follow the same suit, but I wanted to, uh, it's a lot easier to ask than it is to ask for permission than to ask for forgiveness. So that's why I have bring this forward to the council this evening. And then on behalf of all town staff, I'd like to wish all a safe, happy, and above all, a healthy holiday season. That's that's my manager's report for this evening, Mr. Chairman. And then at that, uh, and then I'd like to hear if the council had any thoughts, if it was okay to approach that that way for the uh, Christmas and New Year's Eves. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, I suspect you'll find no objection from anybody. I know we did that last year specifically for Christmas Eve. I can't remember about for New Year's Eve or not. Um, also, I know that just a couple of days ago, the president designated Christmas Eve as a federal holiday uh, for this year. Oh. So um, I think that uh, that alone um, sort of gives you the um, <laughs> rationale for uh, for doing that. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's been finalized or not, but uh, I know I saw a tweet about it. So. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, unless anybody objects, I, I, I don't want to um, stifle discussion about it, but um, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that there's uh, I think uh, consensus for that. So, thank you, thank you very much. I, I know I know staff will be overjoyed. So, thank you for that, and uh, yep. thanks for the update on the uh, federal recognition of that. I did not see that with all the other news breaks these I, days. I so. think it might just be for this year. I don't know if it's yeah. a permanent thing, but anyway. <laughs> um, any other questions, comments for Matt? Uh, on the monthly report. Seeing none, uh, first up is a review of the draft minutes of uh, our meetings held on October 14th and 9th. Uh, is there a motion from anybody? I, Go ahead, Penny. Uh, do we want to do both of them at the same time or do them separately? I have I no objection move. to both unless there are okay. edits or revisions to either. So no. I move that we accept the minutes from the October 14th, 2020 council meeting, as well as the November 9th minutes from the November 9th meeting. Second. Moved by Councilor Jordan, second by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Your motion carries. Thank you. Item number 2-2021 is the adoption of the town council rules. Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing no hands raised, um, we have attached to our packet the um, current town council rules. Uh, they were most recently um, updated, I think in 2018, I think it says at the bottom of them. Um, and uh, every year we go through the process of um, uh, affirmation and adoption of the town council rules. Um, is there any counselor looking to make a motion? Councilor Noonan. Can I um, just, can, can we have a, yeah. is this time for discussion? Okay. I'm just yeah. Well, to... so uh, actually. Um, oh, sorry. Whether we, to... we, if, if we want to, if you have questions, that's fine. Just procedurally, let's get a motion, a second, and then open it up for discussion and questions, if that's okay. Got it. Do you want to make the motion? Sure. What am I, I move that we 
I don't know what I'm moving from. I move that we vote on the adopt the rules. I, sure. Yes. So, but okay. we so we vote to adopt them before we discuss them. Is that how? Okay. And then there's opportunity to offer amendments or changes okay. as part of that. So then so I move. The, the motion has to be on the on the table first. So yeah. Got it. Sorry. I I move that we um, vote on item two dash twenty twenty one the uh, adoption of the town council rules. Thank you, Councilor Noonan. Is our second. Second. Councilor Penny Jordan. Now discussion. Gretchen, you had questions. <laughs> I was just wondering whether section one should be amended at all to include the virtual meetings because it still says that they're in person at the town hall, or if that's not something that we need to. I don't think we need to change the town council rules because the virtual meetings are only a function of the standing order of the governor um, as part of the um, emergency proceedings and things like that. Okay. So we're covered with that under previous um, um, action that we've taken relative to that special order and that's indicated um, on all, not just our town council agenda, but um, other um, other bodies that are meeting as well. So I don't think we need to update the the standing council rules at all, but Deb, you're the expert on this. I'll slip to you to make sure I'm not off on that. Yeah, you are correct. Um, and it will be interesting to see if this legislative session, if there's anything brought to the legislature in any uh, rule or law changes in regards to remote meetings. If there are at that time, uh, we certainly should revisit our council rules uh, at that time as well. Yeah, most of these um, rules here are um, locally authored and, and driven. Some of them do connect though to um, statutory provisions. So um, any other questions or discussion? Um, in section one as well, it talks about when the meeting date falls on a holiday, it'll be moved. And so do we maintain a list of holidays or is it the federal holidays? Because I know I heard from a citizen very recently about meetings that were scale scheduled on Rosh Hashanah and how they couldn't make those meetings. And so I'm curious what constitutes a holiday. Um, I believe it is federal holidays that that is for. So um, the two that come to mind are uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and uh, what's the other Monday holiday that we have? Uh, Martin Luther King, for? Martin Luther King Martin Day. Luther King, yep. Okay. So um, I believe it's based on the federal holiday calendar, but. Thank you. Um, and then the um, the other part of this, which we have run into in very rare instances, is if a meeting does need to move, it requires a vote to do that. It can't just be arbitrarily shifted um, without without voting to move it. So, any other questions or discussions? All right, seeing none, uh, Deb, could you call the roll again, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is items one, uh, three through 16, uh, 2021. Uh, the recommendation here is to move these as a consent item uh, where we approve all of them in block. Um, first, I'll ask if there are any counselors that wish to pull any individual item out. Um, these are all of our um, committee assignments and uh, designated appointments to um, the various regional um, uh, cooperative government organizations that we're part of. So, uh, Jeremy. Just as a, a point of information, the um, consent agenda as written includes items um, 16, which is through the um, MMA Policy Appointments Committee. There are several other appointments that are not included as part of the uh, consent agenda. Could Would it be possible to amend the consent agenda to include items 3 through 24 so that all of the appointments are being considered as one vote uh i think uh, I'm, I'm i'm sorry they're numbered differently I'm confused they're numbered by your number on the bullets got it sorry the the bullets are numbered through 24 but the items are numbered differently yes 
Sorry, I was misreading the, the way. So this is this is the go through okay. item up, up uh, through the code of line, ethics. line item line item twenty four item number sixteen. Yes, my my error. Excuse yep. me. Nope. And I'll just take the opportunity to mention um, this is our first or maybe second go around with the new um, agenda platform, the new town cloud platform. Um, so um, the, for both us as participants and anybody following along um, might take a little bit of adjustment to get used to um, seeing some of that stuff. But um, that is um, what, what explains the discrepancy there. So thanks. So I, I again, <laughs> yeah. So again, just if there's if there are none that want to be pulled out again from three to to sixteen items three to sixteen, um, and then before I look for a motion, I'll ask if there's anybody from the public that wishes to speak on these items as well. So I'm seeing no no hands raised for counselors looking to pull any of these out, um, and I don't see any hands raised from members of the public that wish to speak on these items. So seeing none, is there a motion from a uh, counselor to uh, approve the recommended appointments enumerated in items three through 16-2021? So moved. moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Councilor okay. Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none. Deb, can we have another roll call, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Thank you very Motion much. Motion carries. Item number 17 2021 is uh, Code of Ethics. Um, so uh, the action now for us is to uh, each attest that we have uh, read and understand the code of ethics. Um, and then um, Deb will arrange for each of us to actually sign the documentation for it. So um, no motion to be made. Um, I, I don't know, Deb, do you want do you want to go by name to just affirm that people have done that? Or is our signature on the document enough to do that? I think probably going through it um with each uh, counselor indicating, I think would uh, be appropriate. Okay, so why don't we do that? And since you're, uh, uh, I don't see anybody from the public uh, with a hand raised wishing to speak on this, but I'll give it a second just in case anybody does. So if anybody from the public wishes to speak on the code of ethics, now's your opportunity to. I don't see any hands raised. So Deb, why don't you go down the list and we'll each affirm. Councilor Boucher? Yes, I've read and understand the Code of Ethics. Councilor Devereaux? Yes, I've read it and understand the Code of Ethics. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes, I've read that. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes, I've read it and understand it. Councilor Noonan? Yes, read and affirmed. And Chairman Garvin. Yes, I have read and understood as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Deb. Um, next up is item number 18-2021, the schedule of meetings for 2021. Attached to the uh, agenda this evening is both our regular meeting schedule as well as the proposed budget schedule. This is um, an item that we went over uh, in our caucus last month. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on the schedule of meetings item as presented here in the agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion from a counselor to approve the schedules? Moved by Councilor Devereaux. Is there a second? Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none. Deb, can we vote to approve? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. 
Thank you very much. Next up is uh, item number 19-2021, the uh, renewal, uh, annual approval and renewal of the uh, liquor licenses for the Pudic Club. Uh, are there any counselors that uh, need to make any comments at this point? I don't, Penny, go ahead. Um, I just want to disclose that uh, the Perpudic is a strong supporter of Cape Farm Alliance and we have done uh, several events there together and uh, I don't think it's going to impact how I would vote, but I just wanted people to be aware of that. Thank you for disclosing. Anybody Same. else? Same Thank here. You, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, any counselors concerned about um, uh, what both counselors Jordan have uh, Disclosed? Great. Um, are there any counselors that are members of the Perpudic Club? I'm, I don't think any of the past serving counselors are. I don't know if any of the new counselors are. No? Okay. Uh, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak on this item? I think we have somebody from the Perpudic Club joining us um, on the line. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Tony Decker is here, uh, and I'll, I'll promote him right now to, to speak. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Tony Decker Hi, Decker. from the Pudic Club. Was there anything you wanted to add? Or I, I know David reached out to you before the meeting. I didn't know if, if you were intending to offer any comment or anything. or. No, nothing this evening to comment on. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, no concerns have been raised by police, fire, and code enforcement. So is there a motion from council to uh, approve the renewal of the licenses? So moved, so moved. Moved, moved by Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, could we call the roll, Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up is item number 20 2021 annual appointments to the boards and committees. Is there anybody from the public? that would like to speak about this item. I think amongst our audience tonight, we have a number of the folks um, that are being uh, recommended for this appoint these appointments. On behalf of the council uh, and the town, I wanna to thank all of you for um, coming forward and, and being willing to serve and give of your time and talents to these committees. It's much appreciated. The council very much appreciates the work that all the committees do to help advise and inform us on the issues that are typically coming before us. So thank you all for your willingness to um, be a part of that. Um, is there any counselor that wishes to make a motion? I'm gonna to turn to Councillor Devereaux as past chair of the appointments committee to make the motion actually. Um, I'd like to um, make a motion that we approve all of the um, applicants for the listed committees. Is there a second? I'll second. Councillor Boucher, is there any discussion? Penny, did you have something you want to say? Nope. Oh, I thought I saw your hand go up, sorry. Nope, nope. Um, the only thing I'll add uh, in addition to my thanks to all the folks that have um, stepped forward here is that we do have a few remaining openings uh, that went unfilled uh, as part of this process. Um, so um, the appointments committee is working to recruit and fill uh, with recommendations for those uh, remaining openings. So uh, I think the window is still open for people to apply on that, right? Yep, I'm seeing head nodding. So if you're interested in, in listening to the meeting and have an interest in um, you know, Port Williams Park Committee, Personnel Appeals Board, Recycling Committee, um, or the Board of Assessment Review, all of those opportunities are available and the town would be grateful uh, for your interest uh, in any of those. Seeing no other comments or discussion, uh, we'll have a roll call vote, please, Deb. Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? 
Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chair McGarvin? Yes. Next up is item number 21-2021, the appointment of the Registrar of Voters. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? Seeing no hands raised. Um, we have the statutory requirement of uh, reappointing uh, the Registrar of Voters, uh, which is currently Deb Lane, uh, who I think uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, once again shine the light on the terrific job, Deb, that you've done, um, not just uh, in your tenure on this, but specifically this year, um, when there was certainly much greater focus and, and uh, much more volume of activity than you've probably ever seen before. So thank you for the function that you perform as the Registrar of Voters. Um, and with that, I'm looking for a motion uh, to reappoint Deb to that position with a term to expire January 1, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved by Council Devereaux, is there a second? Second. Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? I, I just wanna say that um, thank you so much, Deb, for all of the work that you've done. You're uh, amazing. And thank you for wanting to continue in this position. I know it's been a lot of work, but thank you. You're fabulous. Okay. Uh, Deb, want to call the roll on your vote here? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, thank you all for your kind words. I appreciate it. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is item number 22-2021, uh, short-term rental amendments and comprehensive plan amendment recommendations. Uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? If you would like to speak. Um, again, please use the raise hand function uh, on the Zoom meeting and you'll be recognized and uh, each speaker has approximately three minutes uh, for their comments. Um, I see hand raised for James King. And go ahead. Oh, you might be muted on your end. There we so your go. Mic is open. There you go. Your How's name that and work? address, please. Hi, I'm Deborah King. And my husband tells me I should not be on Zoom unless I do my hair. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> also, he We're said- only he hearing your voice, so no worries. Oh, good thing, good thing. Also, Jamie, my husband, Pastor Jim King, is very glad to hear that the president says he has Christmas Eve off. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here tonight to tell you a little bit about um, uh, this program that you've uh, hired uh, to look into short-term rentals and uh, the information that it's bringing forth. Um, there have been lots of mistakes. I know you've heard about that. I wonder if there's a, a better program for you to use, or my suggestion is that you hire someone to look into it to give you better information, because the um, it's it's very disconcerting when someone like me on Chris on uh, Thanksgiving Eve gets a letter saying that you have to stop your Airbnb immediately or be fined because you don't have a permit. When I am a homestay and under the laws, the current rules, I don't need a permit. Uh, so it's very confusing. And I, I think that you all may, I don't know if you've really taken into account the fact that you gave out a limited number of permits, but we did not need one under the old rules. The rules hadn't changed. So what's going to happen to all of us who live in our homes and rent out a room? And also, are you aware of the fact that many people got uh, letters saying that they needed to stop their Airbnbs, even though they, um, you know, um, Zev over at the uh, apartments across from Cumbies, he, you know, had a permit 
other people, my folks down the street, they didn't, they didn't get a letter. I got a letter saying I needed a permit when I don't. Um, the other lady across the street, her Airbnb, same thing. They got a letter saying they need a permit and they don't. So what's going on? Um, I, I just suspect that the program is kind of weak for finding mm -hmm. people. Um, is that correct? Um, you, so anything? I'll jump in. I I'll jump in first, and I, I suspect Matt might be able to offer some comment here as well. Um, the program you're referring to is the third party compliance um, platform that we've contracted with earlier in the year in an effort to help us with our compliance and enforcement um, of not only uh, existing short term rental ordinances, but the contemplated ones um, that are uh, part of the agenda item here tonight. I suspect that um, this is probably a, a simple matter of a miscommunication um, about um, uh, getting notification about things that are part of the proposed uh, or, or considered rule changes versus what is in place now. So Ms. King, I know, you know, the, the, certainly the ordinance committee members are well aware of your operation and um, that you're uh, a hosted short-term rental operator and things like that. And, and I, I apologize if you received communication that was um, mm -hmm. confusing okay. and um, also um, upsetting uh, in any way. Yeah, in any way upsetting. Um, but as, as I think you're also aware, you know, no changes have been made as of yet. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I, like I said, I, I certainly expect mm -hmm. that anything that was generated from that was a simple matter of, um, of yeah. miscommunication and yeah, um, it happened not, to a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Matt, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Uh, I would love to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, it was a miscommunication. I think between the front, quite frankly, I think the software uh, worked exceptionally well and identified a lot of them. Unfortunately, it was uh, too early uh, and it's that, and it sent out those notifications in error. And, uh, you know, I, I think you said it, Best that uh, we apologize for the confusion. I know Ben has been in contact with the uh, with the firm and is uh, and is efforting it uh, to make sure that we have that ready when it's time. But uh, not to keep that correspondence going out at this point in time until uh, we do have a full deployment and are ready to to have the software up and going. But it did identify a number of them, and there are some you know there are some uh, definitions I think that will have to be. Uh, Clarified uh, with the with the firm as we go forward, and uh, when the new ordinance does come into come into place. But uh, yeah, it was right. unfortunate, and uh, and I apologize for that because it was extremely premature, and it did uh, send out some, uh, you know, a handful, if not a little bit more than that, uh, letters in error. And uh, I know Ben's yeah. been working on that as well, and do, do apologize for the inconvenience, uh, Mrs. King. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I had a hard time sleeping that night. <laughs> it was tough, but there. You, one thing you need to know is that with COVID, any of us who operate who have uh, spaces they rent in their homes, we've had to separate them. So I think that the program picks up. Um, you know, our categories are only you know a separate space or a shared space, so we have to put our places under a separate space now, uh, for safety reasons. But that you know, in my situation, that means you know full curtains over a hallway, doorway, you know, things like that. Um, so I don't know how they're going to find people in various categories for being, you know, forced into boxes that don't fit right now, but whatever. Yes, well, thank you. And it, yeah, of course it was premature, but how do we, the, those of us who are homestays, how do we get permits when, I mean, there were a limited amount of permits you gave earlier, um, and so we didn't need you, one then, but we will need one for the future. But how do we get? How do we do it right? And how do we not miss the date? <laughs> yeah. So nothing has been enacted yet, as as I think you all know. Right. So when when um, when we do move forward with this, um, you know, we'll be very clear about what those steps are. Um, there's there's no limit to the number of permits. That's not at all part of what's considered. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. in, in either the current ordinance or um, the one that's the changes that have been proposed. Okay, um, great. The, um, the, the requirement, uh, if it moves forward, 
and is approved will be that regardless of the type of, of operator you are, you will need to get a permit though. So even though you, as you correctly stated, you're currently exempted from having a permit to be required to operate, mm -hmm. that will change should the um, proposed changes get approved right. and be implemented. Right. I think but you've also heard us, you, I, the last thing I was gonna say, you've also heard us talk about how, you know, unlike many ordinances that automatically go into effect 30 days after passage, unless um, otherwise indicated that, you know, we've, we have signaled that this will require, um, you know, probably some additional time um, to make sure that all of the finer points and details can be, um, you know, clearly communicated to folks, um, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, build in enough time to be considerate of um, existing bookings that, that might fall right. in that window. That's right. And are, are we going to have, we had a, we had a little health issue around here recently. So I missed a meeting or maybe two, but I noticed that the way things are written up now are very different than they were a couple of few months ago. And it doesn't seem to have any special uh, separation for those of us who are home stays. You know, our, our folks always come for a couple of days. They're not here for a week. It's not like renting a whole house. It's a different experience. Are we going to still be restricted um, by those uh, um, min, uh, mac, uh, minimum day um, parameters? Um, I'm going to answer your question and then look to move on to others um, so that sure. um, other folks have a chance Thank to comment. You. But um, thank you. The thank current, you. yep, not at all. And thank you for your comments. The current um, uh, amendments that are included here tonight um, do not treat hosted any differently than unhosted in terms of the seven day um, sort of resting window. So um, it would require uh, further change from what's here. But I also don't, uh, thinking back, and Penny, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't remember us ever having a carve out for those to be treated any differently to begin with. I, um, I think uh, we were always of the opinion to try and keep things uniform and simple that um, even, even if it is a hosted um, rental that there's still the impact of, you know, um, people coming and going, um, whether that be um, renters or, you know, perhaps service personnel and, and things like that. So um, right. I don't, I don't recall us ever moving off of that seven day um, item. So nope. anyway, nope. Oh, go ahead, Penny. We didn't, you're exactly right. We never, no. we didn't move off that. Um, so next up, it, I see uh, John Volta's hand raised. John, uh, you wanna wait just one second, go ahead. Name and address, please. Go ahead, John. John, we've got you open on this end. I don't know if you're muted on your own. Hmm. John, can you hear us? Because we can't hear you. Why don't we... Um, Pause, John, see if we can't get him reconnected. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Um, I see Craig's hand raised and John. Uh, test, test. John, I think I think you're back on, John. There we go. Sorry, is that working? That's okay. Yeah, okay. so I've got John. Uh, John, if we can get your name and address, and then I, I see Craig and Scott next up in the queue. So, uh, John, ahead, John, John Volk, 33 Phillip Road. I wanted to speak specifically to just the changes in the comprehensive plan that are proposed. Um, partly because of, I think I view the comprehensive plan as a more a little more durable document than than ordinance and regulations, and I was would like to suggest you consider. Uh, striking the words after limited short-term rental activity, beginning with associated with primary residence or in lower density portions of town, striking that from the comprehensive plan amendment. So it just reads limited short-term rental activity, 
may be allowed within a permit structure that allows for tracking of activity and funding enforcement. And now I'll speak to why that is. Um, You've identified in the planning board document two specific goals of the short term rental agreement, which is the quiet enjoyment of residential neighborhoods and preservation of housing stock. Um, to the extent you, you've also identified some solutions for those, but those solutions are not exclusive, nor are they necessarily um, complete insofar as someone may be able to demonstrate how they can have uh, maintain quiet enjoyment with short term rentals in a residential neighborhood many of them do that now it's just to, or how they preserve having stock but putting it in your comprehensive plan doesn't allow for those future um, refinements without having to go back and revisit it um, uh, again uh, is particularly the laws developing around the, the uh, different types of landowners and residences in other areas of the country and there may be challenges this allows you to say we want to limit it and uh, and we want to preserve, and these are the two key functions of it. That seems appropriate for a comprehensive plan. Um, singling out specifically um, residential uses and, and limited density, um, when it's actually contrary to the planning board's own comments about um, limited density, seems unwise. I think it will be stronger, actually, without specifying those two, at least within the comprehensive plan. So I urge that you would consider striking the language that identifies the two solutions to the policy question that's stated in the amendment. Thank you, John. Can I ask that you just repeat for clarity the, the recommended language that you started off yes, your comments with? Yes. Uh, in the Second sentence of the plan amendment, mm -hmm. uh, after keeping limited short-term rental activity, striking associated on through the comma uh, at town. So striking associated with primary residency or in lower density portions of town. Mm -hmm. Just striking that clause. Got so it. Okay. Is, yeah. Great. Thank you very much for your comments. Next up is uh, Craig. Craig, can we get your name and address, please? And your mic is open now. Hello, can you hear me? We got you. Go ahead, Craig. Okay. Hello, my name is Craig Cooper. I live at uh, 150 Ocean House Road. I'm a long-term resident of Cape Elizabeth. I'm a homeowner, a business owner, a landlord, and a property manager here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I want to thank the Mr. Chairman and the members of the council for the opportunity to speak with you regarding the short-term rental, the information before you this evening. Uh, the planning board and its, and its committees have done a lot of work, held numerous workshops and included a public hearing um, recently on November 17th to draft the amendments which are before you this evening for the short-term rentals. I attended that November 17th public hearing, a Zoom meeting attended by approximately 30 other people. I remember a year ago when all of this started with the council and the planning board and we were having public hearings, or you were having public hearings and the attendance was more like a hundred people. The room was packed. Um, and I just think that through the, this, is, this is something that is going to be affecting many, many people and the fact that much of this has been going on and being done during this pandemic, while admirable, admirable in some sense for the people working on it, it's also tragic to many of the public who cannot attend these Zoom meetings or will be negatively affected by this type of behind the Zoom doors type of thing that's the way it's happening. While I understand everyone is trying to be as transparent as possible because of Zoom and the limitations, a lot is lost and it is affecting uh, many people. Um, and I think that's something that should be considered. I've often said uh, in these meetings that it is too bad that a few problem areas of short-term rental have resulted in recommendations like the ones before you that now cast a far reaching, very broad net affecting many 
Cape homeowners negatively when their short-term rentals have never been a part of the problem. I'd like to give you an example. As a property manager for Mary Giftos, who owns, lives at 1055 Shore Road and has a guest house at number six Point Road, one third of a mile away. Mary is just one Cape homeowner being negatively affected by these recommendations um, as they are presently written. I refer you to your section 19-8-14, the short-term rental um, standards. Paragraph B, permitted short-term rentals. Number four, short-term rental adjacent. This section is discussing guest houses, basically. It allows a short-term rental for a guest house as long as it is directly abutting or on the same lot or across the street. However, not Mary's guest house, by example, which is one third of a mile away. I realize that this has been a long and ongoing process and the final outcome has not yet been reached. But at this time last year, before COVID-19 and this pandemic hit, when you were first starting to talk about this, and as we were nearing the end of the calendar year, the fact that many people had contracts already in place for short-term rentals for the summer of 2020. That was brought up and it was agreed that if things were done, what might happen? Again, we still don't know what might happen. Those people were gonna be allowed to honor those contracts which they had already in place. Then COVID hit. The summer of 2020 is one that all of us would like to put behind us, I'm sure. But now we find ourselves in the same time of the year as we did last year. And as someone who has had permits in the past and has a permit now, has done things the right way, we have, per we have contracts in place for the summer of 2021. Some of those are people who could not stay during 2020 because of COVID. Others are possibly new requests. But Chairman Gavin, as you just said, uh, nothing has been finalized yet. So those of us who have been doing this for years and are trying to move forward and allowing and making contracts with people, we don't know the final outcome of this. It will be a while before we do. If you choose, should you choose to initiate things as they're written, I sincerely hope that you would consider allowing for us to honor contracts that we have at the least, at, at the very least. And I'm sure that we'll be talking much more. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, I appreciate your comments. I, I wanna just um, address one thing that you brought up at the beginning about um, uh, conducting business over Zoom. Um, and just say that, um, at least speaking for myself, I, I completely um, disagree with the point that um, that you're raising there, and I just, for the record, want to want to be straight with folks that um, nothing is being done um, to in any way subvert public participation. Um, some of the highest attended meetings that we've had um, in my five years tenure on the council have been um, during this time when we've been meeting via Zoom. Um, I, I frankly don't recall a single meeting on this specific topic um, that involved the attendance uh, reaching the number that you described for in-person at Town Hall. I know we had some meetings where people were packed into the Jordan Conference Room, um, but I don't recall any specific meeting of the Council or the Ordinance Committee um, that, that uh, came anywhere near approaching um, the number of people that you were mentioning. So. Um, I, I just don't want anybody in the public to, to have the impression, which I think is an incorrect one, that um, any of this is being done uh, in any way using the cloak of the public health emergency and the current means by which the council has to meet uh, in order to conduct its business um, to try and, and in, you know, jam anything through or, or anything like that. Um, I think I think the ordinance committee and the council have been um, overly open and transparent in their dealings on this, inviting 
um, an abundant amount of public participation and comment throughout. Um, I know that uh, ordinance chair uh, Jordan um, has gone to great lengths within the ordinance committee meetings to make sure that all opinions have been heard um, and all, uh, all input taken into consideration. So I, ju I just bristle a bit at the suggestion that any of this is being done in a way that's inconsistent um, with uh, what I know are shared goals amongst all the counselors and staff um, that we operate uh, in a fully transparent and fully open manner. So um, I just wanted to make those comments. Um, next up is uh, for hand raise is Scott. And I just want to remind the public to try and limit your comments to about three minutes if you can. Scott, if you could give us your name and address, please. I think I unmuted. Yep, go ahead. We can hear you. Yep. Great. Uh, Scott Rockwell, 119 Old Ocean Road, of course. And I am um, a short term rental host in the currently in the homestay category. Um, the topic that I just wanted to discuss, uh, among other things, um, would be some of the changes as, in the current or, or proposed uh, ordinance, which would impact our uh, model as well as many other models in town, uh, where we try to serve a, where we do have a niche kind of model to try and serve families when they're traveling to try and make it economical for their for their travels and to be able to offer situations that may not be uh, something that they'd be able to achieve in a hotel. Uh, in our particular case, we've had three bedrooms available for, uh, for our guests. Uh, in many cases, we'll have a family with uh, two teenage uh, children, a, a son and a daughter and a single mom. Whereas we have the ability to be able to put them up in three bedrooms and we're only hosting three people. Um, we don't quite fall into the category of the constraints that they have put in now uh, with being only able to use two bedrooms. Additionally, there's other uh, issues in the seven day versus short stay um, restraints that are put in uh, with this new ordinance. The reasoning behind that, as I recall, was to try and keep uh, neighborhoods uh, free of uh, uh, house cleaners and the change that occurs with the st cleaning staff coming in um, you know, all, all at the same time in order to, to get to prepare for a turnover in the, in the unit. Unique to the home space is that we, as the operators of our, of our rooms uh, available for, for our guests, we are the cleaning staff. Uh, we don't have the uh, privilege of hiring others to come in and do all that cleaning. We do it ourselves. And, and uh, as a result, we're not bringing cars, car loads in to come in and, and do a quick clean to, to turn it over. So these are some of the considerations that really weren't taken into account in some of the constraints, or, you know, the changes in the ordinance. And uh, I do look forward to being able to have ongoing discussions and, and perhaps we can all best uh, pen them uh, into the committee um, in order to, uh, in order for us to be able to express our ideas uh, in such a way that you may be able to have the time to look at it as it fits into the new order. Um, we would certainly all appreciate that opportunity to be able to speak uh, to these uh, changes as they affect us individually. And on a side note, uh, th there was, I bumped into one of the counselors recently who probably brought up the good news of uh, three new businesses uh, opening up in, in the town of Cape Elizabeth. They're, this is exciting news for the town. But at the same time, uh, we need to bear in mind that there's not a lot of business uh, uh, zoned properties. And for a lot of us, the changes that come in, in as a result of the new ordinance may result in many in-home businesses. These are uh, 
business opportunities for us to be able to work out of our own homes. There's many of us that as a result of this ordinance will likely end up having to close down that business. So it, it's just another type of uh, change in the, in the uh, economic impact. In the Great, we have three businesses uh, opening in town uh, this month, and we wish them all very well. I hope the same uh, will occur for the rest of our opportunities to be able to do the work that we've only been able to do. Um, and in some cases, some of us have only been able to do that during the past six or seven months well, COVID has shut down our other outside of the home businesses. And uh, if, if it weren't for uh, these home businesses that we have in place, um, the impact on a lot of uh, the hosts in the area would certainly have been a lot more severe. So- uh, Scott, can I ask you to conclude your comments? Cause it's, it's I, um, quite a bit past the three minutes. I, you know me to be very wordy, so I will stop <laughs> at that point. And uh, I, again, I just uh, I hope uh, we can continue the discussion in the best uh, and I agree. You know, if we can uh, pen, uh, pen our concerns into you, uh, email them in, um, maybe we can get some results that way as well. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody else from the public that wishes to speak on this item at this time? I don't see any hands raised. Um, I do want to um, ask, uh, so Joe Shalott from the planning board uh, is joining us tonight. And Matt, if you wouldn't mind promoting him up. Um, I did want to ask uh, Joe, if you don't mind, um, just giving the council maybe a Reader's Digest kind of summary um, of um, the review that the planning board undertook, and um, I know we have uh, both the memo as well as the red line um, that was provided back to us, but if, if you wanted to add any sort of color commentary to that um, about your review process and, and what's, what you've sent back to us. So thanks for joining, Joe. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Shalott, uh, outgoing chair of the planning board. Um, and I uh, so we received the uh, proposed ordinance change back in July, and we had four workshops and a meeting in which uh, in the meeting we took public comment. And um, our initial reaction to the proposed changes was that it was actually very well, very good, and um, would go a long way in solving many of the issues associated with short-term rentals. So we took a two track approach. One was to just take the ordinance and uh, tweak it and improve it, make sure it's clear and uh, deal with any small issues we saw in it. And then uh, unless pragmatic, we also decided to have an addendum in which we would express any consensus views that we had on the short-term rentals. Um, so I don't know if you want me to just go through the summary of changes that we made quickly, uh, if you all have them. Um, I can highlight uh, a few of them. One is that we thought that the use of the homestead exemption was a great concept. Uh, we thought it would be better if you actually required it rather than, uh, as the text uh, said, simply qualify for it. Um, if you uh, don't obtain the uh, exemption, the state penalties do not apply. And also, um, that would uh, put the town in the position of having to evaluate whether someone qualifies for a homestead exemption. Um, so just moving on, we like the RV exclusion. Uh, oh, six two, the proposed statement to replace tourism with transient occupancy it sounds awful, but the building code uh, refers to any kind of residential use less than 30 days as a transient occupancy. So we thought the uh, text should have that. Um, 
verbiage. Uh, we on 640, we added language that the budding land can be counted. We just wanted to make sure that was clear that if you use three lots to get seven acres, that that's one short-term rental and not multiple rentals. Uh, we recommend deleting the 1% fine on the advice of the town attorney. Uh, I believe that was because the state has regulation on maximum fines and that could exceed it. We also uh, added supporting language for the on-street parking um, to make that clear. So there's a couple of little other items in there. And um, if you have questions about them, we can, I can go through that. Uh, we then wrote an addendum. Whoops, hold on one sec. Okay. So um, the addendum was a uh, process by which the board uh, came up with uh, general ideas that we all agreed to. And the first one is that we definitely all believe that short-term rentals um, have a negative impact on the quality of life in a neighborhood. Uh, we all seven of us agreed to that, um, maybe with some dissenting minor points, but, uh, and you know, there's really a couple, uh, the best way to look at that is, is if you have a, how, a neighborhood with 20 houses on the block, you can have one short-term rental and you're not changing the character of the neighborhood that much. Um, you know, permanent residents care a lot about a town. They volunteer for municipal and school events. They, they, they take part in the life of the town. People on vacation are there for vacation. You know, nobody's gonna come to Cape Elizabeth for two weeks and volunteer for the bottle shed. I mean, the fact is people on vacation behave differently. And 95% of the letters that we saw are complaints about how badly people behave when they're in their short-term rentals. So as I said, we felt like the basic gist of the amendments went goes a long way in solving that. Um, we were, were somewhat concerned with the number of days that the uh, short-term rentals can operate. Uh, we recommended a cap that the cap on residents unhosted be reduced from 42 days to a lesser number. Uh, we couldn't really agree on a number though. Um, we all understand the, re the reasoning for the seven acre adjacent um, category. Uh, those properties have historically um, host had short-term rentals with really no issues ever reported, but it just seems like it's creating, it's carving out a special interest niche and the board is just generally uncomfortable with that. Another item is the regulations seem overly complex in terms of when stays begin and end um, and uh, all, all the regulations associated with it. Uh, one of the things we thought that might help a lot is to have a short-term rental season. Uh, makes that the, the uh, effects more predictable for the community at large. And um, uh, that's all I have on that. Um, we thought a second failure to obtain a short-term rental permit should have a more severe penalty. Uh, we thought five year was appropriate. And then finally, 
while we did all agree that short-term rentals should be prohibited in the RA, RB, and RC district, um, we thought that they were uh, acceptable in the business district, such as the town center, um, as they are commercial use. However, the zoning of the town center was really meant to create a commercial level at grade or at the first floor. And um, the zoning ordinance as it stands now has a bit of a loophole in that it recognizes short-term rental as a commercial use, but it allows it at the first floor. And the issue is with that is that the, you know, the town center zone has commercial at the first floor to uh, kind of activate the town center and give it some life. And, you know, I think the vision is that their businesses, um, offices and the like on, on the first level. And where we do have residential, it's up above. And um, if you think of Rudy's or the building in back of Rudy's, uh, the dental, the new dental office that was just approved, those are all um, commercial, use on the first floor with residential above. When you have residential on the first floor, you're potentially having a use that is vacant for a good portion of the year. And it's not, it seems not in keeping with the intent of the uh, town center zoning ordinance. So we proposed that, um, the short-term rental in the town center be restricted to the upper floors and it be uh, changed to a um, accessory use, I believe is how we worded that. So that's what I got. Well, Joe, thank you for the overview um, and summary of uh, the position of the planning board and the recommendations back. I also just want to take a minute to thank you and, and the rest of your colleagues on the planning board um, for the amount of time and effort um, that you put in um, with a really thorough and thoughtful review on this complicated matter. Um, the amount of public input that you received and um, you know digested uh, as, a, as a function of this. And, I know um, from having watched some of the planning board meetings uh, pertaining to this that um, you know there were certainly some frustrations on, on the part of some of the board members um, with some public confusion around um, uh, you know who who are the folks that are making the policy versus who are the folks that are um, you know trying to um, interpret it and um, think about its uh, you know uh, practical effects of its application um, and I think you guys did a terrific job um, on on the latter part. Um, and the, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the time that you guys all put in on it and, and uh, the very thorough recommendations that you provided back. So thank you very much for that and for being part of the meeting here tonight. Great, thank um, you. Are there any counselors that wanna ask a question of um, Joe on behalf of the uh, planning board or um, go ahead, Penny? Uh, yeah, it's not um, necessarily about the uh, ordinance changes, but is it inappropriate to ask that uh, Joe comment on uh, the, the planning board's discussion around the comprehensive plan amendment? Because um, I, I think um, we've had uh, a person who recommended some of the um, words be uh, removed, but how does that change the intent? I know there was a lot of discussion around developing that. So. Yeah, so the intent, I mean, the, the, the crux of the short-term rental uh, ordinance here is that the person has to be a resident of Cape Elizabeth, right? They have to qualify for the homestead exemption. So the language in there, um, the, uh, that's where that sentence associated with primary residence comes from, right? Limited STR activity associated with primary residence. So 
we're saying, let me just read this as here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're trying, I, I think the goal of this sentence is to say that STR activity is limited, but it has to be associated with primary residence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I don't think, I mean, he makes, I think he makes a good point that you could get rid of it and uh, cover cover more situations. But I think that associating with a primary residence really goes to the heart of what the changes to the ordinance are trying to do. Okay, thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions um, for Joe specific to the planning board's review? Okay. Uh, well, again, Joe, thanks very much. Um, so we've got two separate um, items to deal with here. Um, one is the uh, proposed amendment to the to the comprehensive plan. The other is um, the proposed amendments to the short-term rental um, ordinances. Um, I'm happy to take uh, any motion from the floor at this point. My, my recommendation based on where we're at is that we um, consider referring this to our next workshop um, to iron out some of the um, last remaining details. Uh, the other thing I'll add is that um, I, I think at this point we're, we're, you know, to the point in the process um, where uh, we're, we're pretty close to being able to get sort of a final legal review um, from outside counsel, um, just to make sure we're all um, uh, in alignment uh, from that perspective. Um, and I've already talked to Matt about that, about um, uh, getting that uh, uh, lined up. So, um, like I said, happy to consider other other motions, but my recommendation would be that we um, move this on to our next workshop. And just uh, for everybody else's benefit too, both council and public, um, subsequent steps in this would be what, you know, and, and, we, and we are near the very end of the process on this. Um, I appreciate the patience that um, people have had uh, throughout. And I, I think it's, you know, resulted in, in a good output here um, uh, in the form of this ordinance. Um, but we, we, we still have a few, um, a few final steps to take before we get get across the finish line. One of those being, even though the, the planning board has held a public hearing on this, um, the council will also need to hold a public hearing as well. So I'd like to, to get to that public hearing with as close to final as possible, um, you know, assuming that we are able to iron out some of these points that have been raised. Um, and I know that council has continued to have have um, a slightly differing point of view on, on some of the nuanced details here. So um, I think if we can if we can get to that point, bring it to a public hearing and then vote, um, we're probably just a couple of meetings away from being able to um, uh, get this finalized. So Penny, I saw your hand raised, go ahead. Yeah, you kind of took the words out of my mouth. They, uh, where I wanted to propose that we go with this, because I think the, uh, the planning board did um, excellent work in providing some really um, constructive input on uh, where we we're at with the ordinance. And I think that we as a team need to workshop this and then uh, get it uh, pretty well uh, uh, more baked. Um, I, mean, I think we're really, really, really close. Um, and so workshop it and then get it to a council meeting and uh, to a public hearing. So my motion is to um, uh, put this uh, to our next workshop and really work through the uh, details that the planning board has put in front of us. Um, and plus, I think, like you said, Jamie, having some additional input from um, any legal counsel. So uh, motion to move it to um, a workshop. A motion by Councillor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councillor Devereaux, is there any discussion from the council? Jeremy? Um, I believe the um, planner has requested some guidance from the council on, you know, where we'd like to go with that 
uh, transition period. Is that something we should provide tonight in, in the hopes of getting some language drafted that we could review? Or do we want to do that at workshop? Workshop. Uh, I think it's workshop. Workshop. Yeah, I, I think I think we have a recommendation um, uh, and and also um, some other considerations here so that we can take that into you know into the discussion there. Um, I also did want to note that um, uh, the council did receive uh, on the order of about a dozen or so emails um, leading up to this meeting, uh, the vast majority of which were encouraging um, uh, uh, us to move forward with the recommendations from the planning board um, uh, in some form or fashion. Um, so the, the opinion that we received at least by email um, was was pretty consistent on that point, um, and again, I I um, I don't I don't want uh, anybody who's uh, been following along um, through this lengthy process to think that um, at this stage we're not um, getting very close to completing this work, um, but there are still a few uh, just a few remaining steps that we have to take. Notably, um, scheduling a, a public hearing. Um, uh, at a future council meeting um, before we can move forward with any vote or adoption on these. So, um, so I think we're getting very close, but um, not quite there just yet. Um, any other comments from folks? Matt, you want to add something? If, if I may just ask a question for clarification uh, purposes uh, only. Uh, I was just wondering if Councilor Jordan's motion was for both uh, sorry, number uh, 22 and for number 23, and that would be the package I, uh, together. I had a question around that because I, um, and that's why I was just talking about the um, item uh, number 22, because my question is, uh, do we need 23 in place uh, from a timing perspective? Um, is there any timing relationship to uh, 23 in um, being prior to 22? Or can we take them both at the same time at our workshop? I believe, I believe you can take them both at the same time at the workshop because one functions with the other. They're kind of a hand in glove type of uh, exactly. operation. Exactly. And um, so, um, Jamie, what's the uh, protocol for modifying the motion? Do we want to take them at the same time, or I can make a separate motion around 23? I think let's just do a separate one for 23 okay. to refer to workshop. Um, Perfect. Okay. Uh, I think to, to, to honor our process, too, just to invite public comment on that item. We haven't, we haven't put that item yet on the table, so let's just stick with what, what we've got at the moment. So. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so the current current motion is to refer item number 22-2021 um, to a workshop. We do have a workshop on Wednesday. I'm not suggesting that this be on Wednesday's workshop meeting because um, I, I don't think that that's providing proper um, notice for folks. Um, so it would be at our first workshop in January then. That would be January 6th, Mr. Chairman. Yep. So coming right up, it's not, we're not, dropping much time on that at all so okay if there's no further discussion or comments uh i'll call the question and deb can you read the roll call please Councilor boucher yes Councilor devereaux yes Councilor gabrielson yes Councilor caitlin jordan yes Councilor penelope jordan yes Councilor noonan yes chairman garvin yes motion carries Thank you. Um, so next is item number 23-2021. Uh, this is uh, what we just spoke about, the um, uh, language adjustment to the comprehensive plan, uh, item number 86. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak specifically to this item? I see no hands raised. And uh, just for a check, we've got about 25 folks uh, still with us in the meeting. Um, so is, uh, Penny, would you like to make a motion on this then? 
Yes, I would like to move that we uh, uh, move this item to our uh, workshop in uh, concert with the 2022. So 23 and 22 will be addressed at the same workshop. Motion by Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, go ahead, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is item number 24-2021, recommendation from the Fort Williams Park Committee to continue pay and display parking, uh, as well as um, adjust the effective dates for it. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? I don't see any hands going up. Um, Matt, I know that Chris Cutter is on the line. I don't know if, uh, and I see Jim Kearney on the line. Um, Chris or uh, Jim, uh, if either of you wanted to offer any comment at this point, uh, you're welcome to. Jim, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Mic's open, Jim. Go ahead. Oh, it was. Hold on. That was my bad, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. <laughs> he was faster than I was on the, on the unmute. There we go. You should, you go should ahead, be live Jim. Now, Jim. <laughs> Jim Kearney, 1015 Shore Road. I'm currently the chair of the Fort Williams Park Committee. And we raised this issue because uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've had, we started in 2019. So we had a short season in 2019 and a short season in 2020 because of COVID. Um, and it seemed from a traffic perspective that we we're getting heavy traffic in, um, in April of last year and in November of this year. I think the uh, program has been well um, received by the local community, by season pass holders. So the object of potentially extending this season at no financial risk to the town or uh, with any burden to our residents or to our neighbors or season pass holders was uh, very low. So we just thought it was a, a good move and would give us some flexibility if we are going into a kind of a bright and sunny and warm April, it would be good to have the flexibility to deploy the um, pay and display meters in April and not so they wouldn't have to be deployed exactly on May 1st. And likewise to extend the season if it was a warm season, we thought we were gonna have heavy traffic and not have a hard deadline of the end of October. So we just wanted to uh, make those extensions um, from, a, from a seasonal perspective and also to extend the program into future years. Jim, thanks for that summary. Um, are there any questions uh, counselors have that they'd like to direct to Jim? Jim, are there extra costs to extending the season? No, and basically at this point, uh, most of the costs are sunk costs. So it's, it's a matter of what date we're able to get the vendor out there to do the implementation of the equipment, which just means moving it out of storage and onto uh, you know onto the meter stands that exist out there already. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillors Boucher and Noonan, are you both familiar with the current revenue structure from the program? That it's basically it's a revenue share with the with the operator, so that yeah. basically whenever whenever it's active, they're they're taking their cut and we get ours. So that. that um. So Jim, I did have a question. Um, was there discussion amongst the committee about um, uh, instead of having it be um, even at a longer season, uh, instead of having it be a seasonally effective um, program to just making it year round? Yeah, so we had originally discussed that when we first proposed it. Uh, and the thought there was uh, twofold. Number one, we wanted to get the meters out of the 
way of the snow plows. And so we don't have any damage there. There's very little winter traffic and the winter traffic that is there is mostly residential winter traffic. And of course there are no fees for Cape Elizabeth residents or their seasons pass holders. And number two, we wanted to get it just out of the bad weather period. We didn't want to have those displays out. They're hardened for winter, but saltwater winter is a, you know, kind of a whole nother ball game right there at the uh, edge of the ocean. Great, I just wanted to see if it was discussed and contemplated at all. Thank you. Are there other questions anyone has for Jim? Okay, thank you, Jim, for joining. Um, so I'll look for a motion from a counselor to uh, approve the recommendation, which was uh, five zero unanimous vote of the Fort Williams Park Committee last month, um, that we both continue the program and uh, adjust the effective dates to be April 1, 2021 to November 15th, 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councillor Noonan. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Devereaux. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Deb, could you call the roll, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you very much. Next item is number 25-2021, also an item uh, relating to Fort Williams. Uh, the Fort Williams Park Committee has recommended um, establishing a concert series. Um, and at their November meeting voted unanimously um, to recommend to the council that we approve a music in the park series sponsored by community services entitled Sounds by the Sea at Fort Williams. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Don't see any hands going up. I do see that both um, Community Services and Fort Williams Park Director Kathy Raftis and Chris Cutter uh, are both with us. Uh, Kathy or Chris, would either one of you um, like to give a little bit of an introduction here? Hi, Kathy. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, how are you? <laughs> Great, thank you, how are you? Good. Um, so we had started talking at the Fort Williams Park Committee meeting about having music in the park and how we had a couple events this past summer and as a result formulated a subcommittee to get together and talk about how we could do this. Um, on the subcommittee, we each did a little bit of research on different communities and how they handle it. And a lot of it is done through different rec departments, whether it be South Portland has it down at um, Mill Creek Park, Falmouth has one, Standish has one, Gorham has them. And they're, you know, they're done by sponsorship and they're about four or five, six weeks in the summer that they do it on one night. And we went through all of that and formulated um, a sounds by the sea at Fort Williams Park. And we would do six nights on Monday nights and start at 6.30. And the handout that you received said to 8.30, we were going to have it be till 8 p.m., not 8.30. The committee came out with three locations that we'd like to try at the park. Uh, Battery Knoll, Picnic Shelter, and the uh, gazebo, uh, bandstand. Um, community services would handle the sponsorship, get the bands together, handle the contract, and do the advertising for the events. And that's kind of, and the, we brought it back to the committee. The committee voted on it, had a few suggestions. We made a couple little changes and voted to approve it. Okay. Um, Jim Kearney also still with us. Was there anything you wanted to add, Jim, from the committee's perspective or? Uh, yeah, I guess really uh, just one thing. Well, first of all, uh, Kathy and the team did a great job putting this together. Uh, what I wanted to add was that, um, as you know, we've kicked off our um, uh, master plan update process. and some of the early feedback that we're getting from over 250, I think, surveys thus far is that we're hearing from a lot of folks that they wanna keep the focus of the park more for residents and keep things more the same than opening it up for a lot of uh, kind of out of town, you know, 
parking lots and pay, pay events. This is something that we thought would serve the local community um, well. Um, we, we had thought about that before we started getting the results. So it's nice to see that the results from the survey kind of back the concept of offering more opportunities for the residents of Cape Elizabeth to enjoy Fort Williams Park in the summer outside of the domain of the main tourist attractions within the park. Um, so, uh, is there a motion, um, from anyone on the council at this point to, um, approve the recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee for establishing this concert series? Mm -hmm. So moved. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Devereaux. Is there any discussion or further questions for Kathy or Jim? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, uh, Kathy or Jim. Um, I know that having been uh, at events at uh, Fort Williams Park in the past, uh, parking, entering, exiting, and all of that can sometimes be a challenge if there's a, a large turnout. I'm sure you guys had a lot of discussion around that and uh, how that would be managed and um, whether it would be town staff or volunteers that would kind of help orchestrate parking. So we did discuss some of the logistics and the issues around logistics. The initial thought was that this would be a light footprint, not big bands. Um, so we're not looking for uh, significant amplification, it'd be light amplification, if any, and that we would, um, we were doing this in the evening hours when parking and traffic isn't as much of a big deal. Same thing with it being on a weekday as opposed to a weekend. So we didn't feel like we'd be pressing the limits of any of the uh, uh, capabilities of the staff or capacities for parking at this point. And we did do a couple of events this summer that were came up as one-offs that we approved uh, for approved usage within the park. And both of those uh, went well. It was kind of a, a nice way to try to run something before we even conceived of having a summer concert mm -hmm. series. So it just mm -hmm. worked out well to be able to get some feedback from those two events. How does it fit with pay to display? But, uh... Uh, no special um, uh, issues around that. Guests coming in from the outside uh, would need mm -hmm. to pay to park um, if they're using the park um, in, in during mm -hmm. those hours. Residents don't pay and season holder, pass holders obviously wouldn't pay either. Okay, okay. The I think it's a great idea. Cuts off, the current program cuts off um, the parking fee at six o'clock, correct, Matt? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so. That is correct. So if it was, yeah, so if it was later, if these are going to be, depending on what the exact start time is, I'd say minimal impact on the, on the pay revenue. Yeah, the, and the visual is that people, you know, local people will come in, bring dinner, spread out a blanket, enjoy the music, hopefully by then meet and chat with friends and get up and head home by car or by foot. Um, I just had a quick question. I know the library sometimes takes on some of the similar programming. Is it envisioned that this be sort of complementary to that or maybe shifting some of the programming that takes place at the library now on the lawn to be more focused at the board? I don't know if any of that's been discussed or, or considered. We did discuss that and I believe the library is on Tuesday or on Thursday nights. And so we went with Monday night for ours so that there would be no conflict with respect to the library. Great. All right, any other questions or comments? I don't see any dates on here. So what Mondays were um, you considering and why starting with six and not something like three or four if the library does have similar programming? Six is our goal, and we'd have okay. to see how many bands that we can uh, lock into place at this point. Um, and I believe we were thinking it's starting the week after Fourth of July week. Okay. Any other questions or comments? 
Okay. Seeing none, uh, call the question. Deb, can you read the roll for the vote, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, I see a hand raised by um, Doreen Terrio. I don't know if, oh, and then it just went down. Okay, never mind. I don't know if it was for that item or something else. Um, okay, uh, next up is item number 26 2021, uh, Maine Bureau of Highway Safety Impaired Driving Enforcement Grant. Um, it's a recommendation of the finance director. Uh, in conjunction with a grant that was pursued by Chief Fenton and the Public Safety Department um, to support uh, efforts to um, combat impaired driving, that the council accept the grant in the uh, award amount of $1,954.88 uh, with their gratitude, and that any match of uh, any match requirements will be part of the police department's operating budget. Uh, which is allowed by the terms of the grant. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? I see no hands raised. Is there any counselor that would like to make a motion on the acceptance of the grant? So moved. Moved by Councillor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Caitlin, is that a hand? Yeah, my camera. Why not? Go. There we go. Seconded by Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is item number 27-2021, uh, our annual update on the property tax assistance program. Uh, tax assessor Clinton Sweat has been patiently waiting with us. Thank you, Clint. Uh, we always do this to you, though you're not at the very end today. So I squeezed you in only after an hour and 48 minutes. Um, to the defense <laughs> of the manager, Mr. Chairman, uh, he is at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is still some legacy uh, tax assessor hazing going on from the former assessor Clint. Just a little bit. Know. So, in any case, um, every year the assessor, um, uh, per the terms of uh, the program that we developed a couple of years ago, comes forward to us with a report on uh, uh, access and usage to that program. So excited to hear what you have to say, Clinton. Thanks for joining us. Great, thank you, and thank you for having me, uh, Chairman Garvin. And I'd like to uh, welcome our new members to the council, uh, Councillor Boucher and uh, Councillor Noonan. Welcome to the welcome to the team. Uh, yeah, so I'll give you a quick uh, recap of our 2020 Senior Tax Relief Program. This is the third year of its uh, development, and I got to tell you, it's it's a great program. Um, you know, being the, uh, the town assessor is, is not a real glamorous position, but uh, I can tell you, I, I really feel happy uh, interacting with all of the, the senior people and um, they're, they're so appreciative of this program and it's, it's grown for the third year in a row. So uh, I'm very proud to be the, the steward of this, this program. Um, so without much further ado, uh, let me just go over the numbers real quick. Uh, this year we've uh, approved 181 applications. I've only had to deny 14 for various causes. Um, let's see, yeah, the, uh, yeah, um, so the, um, the budget for this year, for this fiscal year was 85,000. 
uh, I would I would recommend upping that a, a little bit to maybe ninety five thousand for the next fiscal year, because our our numbers keep uh, keep increasing. Um, and for those that are that are new, let me briefly explain the program. It'll be the back of the uh, napkin kind of description. Um, you have to be a senior, sixty five years of age or older have to have lived in Cape Elizabeth, be a property owner for 10 years or longer, have the homestead exemption, have an annual income, household income of less than $60,000, and your taxes have to be greater than 5% of your gross adjusted uh, taxable income. And if you meet those requirements, you'll get a rebate check of $500 to go towards um, whatever, whatever you need. Um, and it's a, it's a great program. And that's basically uh, it in a nutshell. And are there any questions uh, about the program? Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, Clint, thanks for um, this report and thanks for your, your work on this program. I think this is a, a great mechanism for, for providing some property tax relief to folks who really need it. Um, I, I see, it looks like we're, um, I, my recollection is that we went a little over budget last year and put some additional money into this program. It looks like we're probably a little bit over budget on this year's as well from your report. Um, yep. And I, I was just curious um, on your thoughts about uh, budgeting for next year. I know we'll take that up in January, but um, do, you, do you anticipate a similar level of growth in this program or how, um, you know, what are we looking at for projections in terms of, of um, eligible residents who may still, you know, pursue some tax relief through this? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I looked at the numbers from uh, our first year, 2019, or yeah, 2019 to 2020, there was a 28% increase of applications from 132 the first year to 169 the second year. In this third year, it was only a, an 8% increase to 181 applicants, so it kind of I'd like to think that we're, we're we're getting close to that sweet spot of of everybody who's going to apply for it will apply for it. Um, so that'll that'll put our number right around 95,000, um, even if we have a little bit of an increase next year. Great, so I think you. we're right on target. Clint, I remember um, former Councilor Straw um, uh, raising questions, which I'll do uh, in his absence now, about um, some of the outlier um, applicants in terms of um, property valuation and, and income and things like that. Are, are there, is, have, over the three years of the program now, have you seen a little bit more, um, I guess for lack of a better word, uniformity around profile of applicant, or is it still a little bit um, I, I guess th what I'm trying to get to is making sure that we're getting the assistance to the people who need it, not the people who just are, are kind of able to take advantage of it based on some yeah, of the other criteria. I, yeah, I think we are. I think we've got good parameters that are set. Um, you know, some people, you know, the, the $60,000 uh, income, you know, some people, you know, <laughs> I, I had to deny them by this much. <laughs> You know, uh, and other uh, other cases. Well, of the of the fourteen that were denied, uh, six of the applicants were over the income. Um, three of them, their taxes were not greater than five percent of their income. Um, three of them had no homestead exemptions, which those people I was able to mail them or email them in a, a homestead application get that on the books for next season. So we are helping those people out. And one person actually moved out of town and still applied. So they were denied. Yeah. <laughs> so are, we, we, we specifically did not put a property valuation parameter into the formula. Is, has your opinion changed on, on that at all about whether or not we should consider that? No, nope, I think we're, uh, I think we're, we're right where we need to be. The uh, the uh, 
Yeah, the average valuation is 262,300. You know, in Cape Elizabeth, that's, you know, that's probably middle to middle to low value. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think we're, I think we're, we're, we're getting the people we need. And I, and I have to tell you the story, you know, one couple, and I'm not going to say their name, but the gentleman called me up. He was in his nineties and he, his, his wife is blind. Um, he can't hear. And quite frankly, he had trouble reading. And I actually drove to his house, you know, wore a mask, you know, and was able to do the application with him at his house. Um, he signed it and, and, and he told me, he said, you know, $500 is, is to a lot of people, that's not much money, he said, but for me and my wife, it's, it is a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. and it really, you know, kind of you know, made me feel good to help him out. Mm -hmm. So That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Are there any other questions uh, for Clint? Yes. Go ahead, Gretchen. Um, great, thank you. Uh, so I just had two quick questions. One is, it sounds like people can reapply year after year. Am I getting the right impression there? Yeah, mm -hmm. what, I, what I do is I maintain an Excel spreadsheet and if they've applied, um, even if they were denied, I, I keep them in my spreadsheet and next year I just automatically send them a new application. Um, so it's works out well. Uh, usually uh, before the program is launched, I touch base with the Cape Courier and the and our webmaster and, and push that information out uh, to people that might not know about the program. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice program. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I also just wanted to know, is there um, the intent or the ability at some point to raise that 60,000 just to keep up with inflation or? Um, yeah. it's something to talk about. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's an ordinance that we can certainly revisit. Okay. Um, you know, I've had six, six people that I've had to deny because of the, um, the limitations. Uh, but if you do that, not only are you, you going to get more applications, but you're probably going to get more denials as well. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Are there any other questions? Yes. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, I just, I, more a comment than a question. I just wanted to note, um, following up on, on Councillor Noonan's question, um, that I, I think that's something I'd like to maybe start keeping an eye on um, as the program moves forward. Um, and just sort of, uh, if you start to see a pattern emerging or a trend where there's a lot of people who are sort of right at the, the income threshold, but otherwise seem to meet the spirit of what we're trying to do here. Um, I think that'd be helpful for the council to hear in future years. Hmm. Sure. Okay, if there's no other comments or questions, uh, I'll entertain a motion to acknowledge receipt of the report uh, with our thanks to the assessor. Um, for his work and management of the program. Is there a motion? Motion. So moved. Motion, motion by Councillor Boucher. Is there a second? Second. Second by, I saw Councillor Noonan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, Deb? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chair McGarvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next up is item number, thanks again, Clint. Um, next up is item number 28-2021, Willowbrook Culvert Replacement Grant. Um, I think that I saw Maureen O'Meara in the list of folks, I do. So Matt, if you wanna promote her up to participant. And uh, Maureen, would you like to give us a brief introduction on this? And then I'll see if there's any public uh, comment.
Good evening. Anyway, how are you? Thank you for your patience. No problem. Do you have any questions or do you need a summary? Would you mind just giving us a brief introduction? Oh, I'd be happy to. So uh, this is a project a couple of years ago, the council had a presentation on an assessment of the 16 you know, worst culverts in Cape Elizabeth and um, a team effort af went after uh, grant funding for the worst culvert, which was the winner, the, cul the Willowbrook culvert. Just to summarize, there are two culverts in Willowbrook. They're corrugated metal, they're badly deteriorating but their uh, most impressive feature is they are immediately underneath two very large sewer lines, about 35 inches of sewer lines carrying uh, about half a million gallons of treated and untreated wastewater back and forth across Willow Brook. And we want them to keep doing that and not rupture. And so as these culverts deteriorate and are providing probably structural support to the sewer lines, it was very important that we get them replaced. So uh, we went after this grant and uh, for a $75,000 match, which by the way, would not be sufficient money to replace the culverts in kind. We are instead getting a grant which will allow us to replace the culverts which, with a much superior piece of infrastructure, much more environmentally sound and uh, much more resilient to climate change. So it's a $343,000 grant. Uh, we are required to do a title study before the uh, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in the grant. We were including that in the work anyway, and we're very confident that uh, we'll get the final money. And I just want to recognize that this really was a team effort. Uh, Steve Harding and Shane Kelly from Sebago Technics, um, Jake Amon from the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve was uh, instrumental in helping us over all of the environmental requirements. And there are some other people out there whose names I won't mention, but you know you helped out. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Maureen, for the overview. And also uh, to all those folks you just mentioned, and uh, always appreciate your continued dogged pursuit of these opportunities. Um, this, is a, a, this is a big one. I did want to turn it over to Matt real quick, just to add a little bit more clarity on the couple of notes here on the agenda item relative to us already having authorized the cash match, but it, Matt, you've got a note here about making sure we formally include it in the budget. Can you just uh, clarify that for folks? Yes, this is uh, this will in many ways firmly cemented into our capital project capital uh, project items for next year's budget, the fiscal 22 uh, budget. We do have a, a couple of mechanisms that we will explore as far as paying uh, for this. It uh, may be out of the sewer fund, uh, but we will definitely, uh, we do want to allocate funds for that because as Maureen said, and uh, uh, she downplayed uh, the significance of this, uh, her work was exemplary when it came to acquiring this, uh, to get this into place. And with the threat of what we have, uh, if, if that was to rupture uh, and, and stressing the importance of it, uh, this is something that we, we really can't, A, can't wait much longer to do, uh, and B, uh, it's something that uh, of all the priority items that we will have on our capital, this would be probably top three uh, for the upcoming budget. So uh, by doing this, we are going to be doing our, our, our the title study, as Maureen had said as well, uh, that, will, that will firm it up, uh, but we'll also be locking in that amount of uh, funds. So by, by flexing that 75 grand and, and I mean, any, it all comes down to the council's final approval, obviously, but this would be one that we, we can have the funds uh, available out of where we are right now and earmark them for next year's, next year's budget. Great, thank you for that. Yes, um, before thank we you. do move on, I wanna just ask, we've um, got just a couple of folks left um, joining us from the public. Uh, if anyone wants to speak on this item, you're welcome to do so now. Seeing none, um, is there a motion from anyone uh, to accept the grant um, uh, conditional upon the completion of the study that was just mentioned? So moved. Moved by Councillor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Councillor Devereaux, any further discussion? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Devereaux. I just have a couple questions. Uh, the title study, typically, how long does that take, Maureen? Does it um, take a couple months, or is it something that would take six, eight months? 
Actually, we're, we're really very fortunate. Uh, when we had done that uh, culvert assessment I talked about a couple of years ago, one of the outcomes of that was that the town of Cape Elizabeth got some grant funding to study the Sawyer Brook culvert. And we hired Acadia Engineering to do all of that modeling. It was a pretty intensive project. And, and I know that's one of the things that's kind of pending on a council agenda sometime when you have some free time on one of your workshops. I think you might find it a very interesting study. So what we're able to do is we're able to go back to the same gentleman with the same modeling work he's already done. And he can use that as the basis for the title study for Willow Brook. And uh, he's, he's already given us a contract. We're ready to sign it. And he thinks he can get it done in just a few months. That's, that sounds wonderful. So um, really the time frame would be 2022. There's no way we could get the money and start this um, in 2021. We have, we have some permitting we have to acquire. Uh, the other thing is, and, and this is when the engineers do a better job than I do, there is a very fixed time frame when you're allowed to do construction work in a tidal area. So um, we, we really aren't gonna make the first time frame. We have to wait for the second one. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all your work on this. Any other comments or discussion? Jeremy? I just wanted to add on the, the kudos um, and appreciate all the work that Maureen's put into uh, making this happen. Um, these are not, as uh, having gone after MNRCP programs on other projects, this is a heavy lift and I just want to really appreciate all the work that Maureen's put into this. Um, also wanted to know um, just that uh, I, how much I appreciate the fact that Cape Elizabeth is staying ahead of the curve on this. Um, there are roughly a thousand tidal restrictions in Maine that are associated with small roads and dams and you know other culverts like like this one um, and we've just done a great job as a town staying ahead of that understanding where those liabilities are and taking proactive steps to address them so again um, thanks to more uh, Maureen's good work in, in helping keep us ahead of the, the curve on that thanks Jeremy any other discussion seeing none Maureen, uh, I'm sorry, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yep, thank you. Motion carries. Great. Um, Next up is item number 29-2021, uh, standard easement deed um, being granted to CMP and Verizon. This is in follow-up to the item that we approved last month um, uh, for the siting of the new communications tower up at the transfer station property. Uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, it's recommended that we grant a standard utility easement to CMP and Verizon um, for the tower site located on Denison Drive and authorize the town manager to sign on behalf of the town. Is there a motion? So move. Okay. I didn't hear who that was. Who, who made Me. the motion? C Caitlin, thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear, I couldn't. Second. Uh, Moved by Councilor Caitlin Jordan, seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Councilor Noonan? I just have a quick question. These are both just for the operation of the tower, correct? These lines. Uh, Go ahead, Matt. Great, great question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great question, Councilor Noonan. Uh, this would be, uh, it's a standard utility easement. The power is on the other side of the, uh, of the driveway at the recycling center and uh, to get them to go across and onto that other section, they need to have the easement to run the wires there uh, to come to it. And it's the good thing is it's a single phase line, which is uh, a much more cost effective for us. And they'll be putting that in there, but also uh, the telephone line. So they will have a landline connection as well. So it's uh, it's like if you were building a new house, you would have those uh, easements that you'd have to place on, on, on your own. You're welcome. 
Any other questions or discussion? Okay, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up is item number 30-2021, acceptance of annual gifts and donations. Uh, we have attached to the agenda a list of um, uh, various donations that have been made to the town in the past year. Uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? Seeing none, I will, uh, on behalf of the council, just extend thanks and gratitude to all these folks uh, for their uh, donations and contributions. Uh, we're very grateful. And with that, is there a motion to accept the gifts and donations? So moved. Moved by Councilor Devereaux, seconded by Councilor Second. Caitlin Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Go ahead, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. And we have four folks left. Um, are there any final uh, comments from the public for items not on the agenda tonight? See no hands raised. So uh, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. We adjourn. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. I saw Jeremy for the second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, go ahead, Deb. Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you Wednesday for our workshop on FOIA and Code of Ethics and stuff. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Have a good night. Good night.